Okay, would you please stand for the call to worship? We cry to you, O Lord. Hear our cry for mercy. If you keep our record of sins, who could stand? With you, Lord, there is forgiveness. Therefore, we fear you. We wait for you, O Lord. Our souls wait. We put our hope in your word. We wait for you, Lord, more than watchmen wait for the morning. We put our hope in you, Lord. We wait for that there is unfailing love. With you, there is full redemption. Would you please turn to 1017 in your hymnal supplement it's as a deer. Pray with me, please. Lord, help us to live lives worthy of your calling. Unite us in your spirit. Strengthen our bonds of peace. Build us up until we reach unity and faith and become mature followers of Christ. As we hear your words, serve one another and speak truth in love. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Ephesians 4 tells us that grace has been given to all of us. Some are graced at to be church leaders, like evangelists, pastors, and teachers, in order for the in order for the entire body of Christ to do its various ministries. Our offerings today will support both our local church and those studying to prepare to be church leaders. Our special offering for this month goes to support the denomination seminary, Bethany Theological Seminary in Richmond, Indiana, which prepares people for the calling of church leadership. You may give your 
regular offering in the offering plate and the spacer offering to Bethany Theological Seminary in the service cup at the back of the sanctuary. You can also give to, e to either offering online through the Tithely app or our website, nettlecreekchurch.org. I'm going to be reading from Genesis 26, 1 to 6. Now there was a famine in the land besides the earlier famine of Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, and Ger. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you and bless you. For you and your descendants, I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because Abraham obeyed and kept my requirements, my commands, my decrees, and my laws. So Isaac stayed at Gur. Thank you. Thank you, Leland, and thank you, Marjorie and Sally, for helping us lead music today. Well, three boys were in the schoolyard bragging about their fathers. The first boy says, Dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper, calls it a poem, and they give him $250. Second boy says, That's nothing. My dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper, calls it a song, and they give him $2,000. Third boy says, I got you both beat. My dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper, calls it a sermon, and it takes eight men to collect all the money. <laughs> well, today, I'm going to talk about living in the blessing. We're continuing our Genesis series. We're about halfway through Genesis now. And we're going to be looking at Abraham's son, Isaac, and how he gets to live out the blessing because of his father, Abraham. Isaac lives in the blessing because he is a child of Abraham, and he is in the covenant with the God of Abraham. Again, I want you to see verses 3 through 5. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath. Another thing you could say there for confirming the oath is the covenant. I swore to your father, Abraham, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. I will give them all these lands. Through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. So he's basically saying this is the next generation now. I gave this covenant to your father, Abraham, and now Isaac, I'm going to carry this on with you. I want you to hear directly from me the covenant that I had with your father and the covenant that you're going to carry on with me now. But notice here he says that this is what I swore to your father Abraham. And then in verse 5, because Abraham obeyed me and kept my requirements, my commands, my decrees, and my laws. So Isaac here inherits this blessing. Isaac receives this blessing because of his father, Abraham, and his relationship to Abraham. Again, Ishmael had a relationship with him as father, but he was not the covenant child. We talked about that a few weeks back. Uh, Isaac was actually the covenant child, and he lives this out because of Abraham. Now, you might say, well, that's great for Isaac. I'm glad Isaac inherited that blessing. Wonderful. What's that got to do with me? <laughs> Let's go to Genesis, or excuse me, Genesis, Galatians chapter 3. One of the reasons I'm spending so much time in Genesis this year, 
because so much of the New Testament is built on what happened in Genesis, particularly the story of Abraham. So Abraham is particularly important in the New Testament, especially Paul's writings. He often goes back to Abraham and talks about him in his writings. So there's one spot in Galatians 3 I want us to look at today, Galatians 3, verse 6. He's writing now to the church in Galatia, who are Gentile people, not Jewish people. So they didn't have the physical lineage. They were not physically descended of Abraham. But he says here, consider Abraham. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And we've looked at that scripture before in the Old Testament. Now, look at the verse 7 right after it. Understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. So what's the connection here for us to see? Isaac was blessed because he was a covenant child of Abraham. We, he's saying here, as Gentile believers, are blessed because we too are covenant children of Abraham, even though we're not because physical descendants. Because of our faith in Jesus, spiritually we become descendants of this line. See that again. Understand that, that those who believe are children of Abraham. Now verse 8. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles, those who are not of that physical line, by faith. And announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. We just read this again with how he shared it with Isaac. All nations will be blessed through you. So all nations, all the Gentile peoples will be blessed. Right? So we are blessed through Abraham's line. And then verse 9. So those who have faith are blessed. You see that word? Isaac was blessed because of his father Abraham and the blessing placed on him. We as believers are blessed because of our faith in Jesus and then we are put, grafted in as Romans says, grafted into the blessed line. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham. See the connections now? Abraham was blessed. He was a man of faith. God had called and blessed him. And his physical line was blessed, including Isaac and those that would follow. Now we get grafted in by faith into that same line. And we too are placed in the line of blessing. Now verse 10, all who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. And he goes on to explain the curse of disobedience. But then in 14, he flips this around. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. So that by faith, we might receive the promise of the Spirit. In other words, if we're trying to rely on observing the law, that's only going to put us under a curse. But if we trust in Jesus by faith... Like Abraham, by faith, trusted in what God told him, he was blessed. So that word shows up repeatedly here. The Gentiles are blessed. All who have faith are blessed. And he redeemed us that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through faith. So I want us to first of all believe that we're blessed. <laughs> that we have a supernatural God blessing on our lives because of our faith in Jesus. We are now in the blessed line. And we have to remember that especially when we go through hardship, especially when we face difficulty, especially when we face troubles and trials. I quoted this last week, but I'm going to pull it in again. John 16, 33, when Jesus was talking with his disciples, he said, in this world you will have troubles. In this world, you will have trials. In this world, you will have challenges. But then he goes on to say, take heart. I have overcome the world. Or for the sake of this sermon today, we can say, take heart. Because he has given us 
the blessing. Yes, we're going to have trials. Yes, we're going to have challenges. Yes, we'll have troubles to deal with, but we can take heart because he has given us the blessing. And now I want to go back to Genesis 26. And I want to look at some of the trials, some of the challenges that Isaac faced and how God's blessing brought him through those trials and God's blessing brought him through those challenges. And I believe in that we can learn for ourselves when we face similar kinds of trials, similar kinds of challenges, that we too can believe in God's blessing to carry us through those things. Let's go back now to Genesis 26.1. Now there was a famine in the land. There's a challenge. There's a trial. There's a hardship, right? A famine. When there's a famine in the land, what happens? There's lack. There's not enough. I could put it like this, financial lack, financial hardship, financial difficulty, sometimes related to physical famine in different parts of the world. Sometimes it's related to other factors that cause financial hardship and financial trouble. In the past year and a half, we've experienced some of this in our world. Production down, distribution down, inflation up, prices up. It's becoming more challenging, more difficult financially. So he says here, there was a famine in the land. There was a time of lack in the land. And this is a hardship that he has to face. Because when it comes down to it, we all have physical needs that need to be met. And when there's famine and lack and not enough, then it's hard to meet those needs. And this is, again, besides the earlier famine of Abraham's time, it's referring back to Genesis 12. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. And there's a whole line of stories of Abraham and him. But then verse 2, the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt. Now, why would he have to tell him that? Because in Genesis 12, when Abraham faced famine, the earlier one, what did he do? He went to Egypt. And when he went to Egypt, he said, this is my sister. And then he got wealth from there. Because Egypt was the land of prosperity at that time. So Isaac is probably thinking similarly, well, when my dad faced the famine, he went to Egypt and he was financially blessed down there. And so he was tempted to do the same thing. And God was telling Isaac, don't do it that way. I don't want you to go to Egypt. I want you instead to, in verse 3, or the rest, second half, verse 2, live in the land where I tell you to live. This is really important about living in God's blessing. Because oftentimes we're tempted just to follow worldly advice on how to prosper. Worldly advice of how to be in a place of provision and prosperity. We often listen to worldly advice of what career to go into or where to move to or what investment to invest into. And I'm not saying that's always bad. It worked out well for Abraham. But we always have to know what is God wanting me to do? What is God calling me to do? Because in verse 3 he says, stay in this land for a while. And I will be with you, and I will bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands. In other words, in the plan of God, there was a place of blessing for Isaac. And it didn't necessarily mean following the worldly wisdom. We have to figure out from God what is our place of blessing. And our place of blessing may not be what the world would say. The world might say, okay, this is where you need to invest your money. This is where you need to live. This is the career field you need to go into. This is how you're going to succeed. This is how you're going to prosper. We're following the trends. We're following the market. We're following what's going on. If you really want to succeed, do this. And again, I'm not saying that that's bad in and of itself, but when that takes over what God has told you to do, that's a bad thing. 
If you take a job just because it looks like a way to be prosperous, or if you move somewhere just because it looks like a good place to go, but it's not where God wants you to be, you're going to get out of God's blessing. And if Isaac would have gone down to Egypt, it would not have gone well for him there. He had God's blessing on his life. That didn't mean it would be anywhere he wanted it to be. He had to find God's place a blessing. So this is a not as great example. But in my college days, I was going into education. And all the wisdom from all of those in the education department was, go into elementary education. You're a male. They'll love you in elementary education. You need to go into elementary education because you're going to get any job you want if you go into elementary education. I said, well, but I want to go into secondary education. <laughs> and then I said, I want to major in history. And then I said, I want to coach sports. They're like, that's what every male does. <laughs> Don't do that. You're going to go to a job. There's going to be 10 people just like you. And you will not get a job. I said, but I don't want to do elementary education. <laughs> I particularly do not want to do K through 3. <laughs> All right? I have sub-taught anything, anywhere. I have had lots of experiences. And I, through my sub-teaching, realized K through 3 was not my thing. Okay? I could do it, but it wasn't something I looked forward to. Crazily enough, I enjoyed 7th and 8th. Okay, you're like, you are absolutely crazy. Much rather deal with a kindergartner than an eighth grader. <laughs> but for me, I love seventh and eighth graders. That's what I enjoyed. That's what I had fun with. Even as a sub, you're thinking, a substitute teacher for seventh graders? Are you crazy? I enjoyed that, though. I had fun with that. But I wasn't having as fun with the kindergartners. Okay? I, an an all-day kindergarten, I, I'm not a fan of that. <laughs> I was happy when I could send them off at the midday and then get the next group. But anyway, worldly wisdom, you need to go into elementary education. I don't feel like I'm supposed to go into elementary education. I'm going to stick with secondary. And you know what God did? Took me out of both of them. <laughs> And said, you're going to do ministry. So I went that route. And again, worldly wisdom doesn't say, hey, if you want to succeed and do well in life, go become a minister. In two small churches in a small town. <laughs> That's not what worldly wisdom says. Right? Worldly wisdom would say, go to a big place or go to a big church or go to this. But I believe... This is God's place of blessing for me. So I need to be where God wants me to be. And others need to be where God wants them to be. God has a place of blessing for us, and it may not be the world's way of doing it. The world might say, go to Egypt, but God says, stay here. So what land has God called you to be blessed in? What church has God called you to be blessed in? What town as God called you to be blessed in. That's where God wants you to be. So let's see how it worked out for him. He stayed there, right? Verse 6, so Isaac stayed in Gerar. He didn't go down to Egypt. Now verse 12, Isaac planted crops in that land. This is really important, especially in our world today. Isaac worked. <laughs> he planted crops. I know there's a lot of jobs available in our world today. And Isaac decided he was actually going to work. I didn't quote the scripture this morning, but there's a scripture in the New Testament, Paul writing, says if someone won't work, they shouldn't eat. And that doesn't mean that they don't work at all, but the heart and the attitude should be towards that. We know there are certain ages and stages of life where that's okay not to, but the attitude should be, I'm not just here for a free ride. I want to contribute. I want to give something. So Isaac planted crops in that land. And the same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. 
I want you to see that. He was successful there because the Lord blessed him. Now, had he gone down to Egypt, it may not have worked out like that. But he stayed where God told him. He did what God told him to do. He planted his crops. And the same year, he reaped a hundredfold. While there was a famine around him, he reaped a hundredfold. He got the blessing in a world of famine. He had more than enough in a world of lack. Verse 13, the man became rich. And his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. <laughs> So he prospered while the world around him didn't. He lived in God's blessing. But remember, he stayed where God told him to stay. He didn't just go do the worldly advice. Now I'm going to jump to number four in my outline because I feel like it fits better. But originally I put it number four. Let's just go right now to verse 14. So you probably have to jump down, Peter, on my, on my screen. But go down to verse 14. He had so many flocks and herds that the Philistines rejoiced with him. <laughs> they were so happy because of his success. It says they envied him. And that is one of the results sometimes of walking in God's blessing. Sometimes people get envious, jealous, upset, they might smile at you and say, I'm glad to hear it, but under their breath they're thinking, mm. <laughs> why are they getting that? Can't believe they're driving a new car. How come they got a boat? And here I am in this. Envy, jealousy, instead of celebrating God's blessing on their life. So now we have another problem. He started out with a problem of famine. Now he's got a problem of relationships. A problem of envy, a problem of jealousy, a problem of rivalry. So all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham, verse 15, the Philistines stopped up, filling them with earth. We'll see how he prospers now. And they start working against him. We're going to fill up all these wells. Verse 16, then Abimelech said to Isaac, move away from us. This was his place of blessing, right? Again, like I said last week, just because you're in God's will, just because you're in God's place of blessing, I talked about it with marriage last week, but just because you're in God's place of blessing doesn't mean you're not going to have any hardship. Yeah, he was wealthy. Yeah, he was rich. Yeah, he ripped a hundredfold. And guess what else he got? People working against him. People envying him. People hating him. People working against him and trying to get him out of there. Move away from us. We don't like you anymore. You've become too powerful for us. I know the reason's different, but I couldn't help but think of Beverly Hillbillies here. Right? Jed Clampett shoots the oil, and they say... Ken folks said, Jed, move away from here, right? This is what they're saying. Move away from here. California is the place you ought to be. Loaded up the truck and they moved to Beverly, right? So Isaac moved. Now he's saying, okay, I guess I got to move now. So he moves away. From there, and he encamps in the valley of Gerar, and he settled there. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died. He gave them the same names his father had given them. 19, Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. All right. God's providing. Praise God. Verse 20, but the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdmen and said, the water is ours. Any parent has heard these words, <laughs> right? Two kids want the same thing. Mine! So he named the well Essek, which means dispute, as they disputed with him there. Then they dug another well. But they quarreled over that one also, so he named it Sitna, which means opposition. Do you see the trouble he's facing? They keep working against him to try to stop him from prospering. And he moved on from there, 22, and dug another well. And no one quarreled over it, so he named it Rehoboth, which means room. 
saying, Now the Lord has given us room, and we will flourish in the land. It's very interesting how Isaac responds to all this trouble. Notice he doesn't fight him. <laughs> he doesn't say, all right, we're going to war over this well. He says, oh, well. <laughs> we'll find another well. And eventually he does. And God blesses him. And he has room to flourish. And they begin to prosper again. Verse 23, from there he went up to Beersheba that night. Verse 24, the Lord appeared to him and said, I'm the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you, and I will bless you, and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. 25, Isaac built an altar there called the name of the Lord. He pitched his tent, and there his servants dug a well. Now 26, meanwhile, Bimelech came to him from Gerar with Ahuzath, his personal advisor. How would you like to have a personal advisor named Ahuzath? Welcome. This is my personal advisor. His name's Ahuzath. And as Fickle, the commander of his forces, Isaac asked them, Why have you come to me since you were so hostile to me and sent me away? 28, we clearly saw the Lord was with you, so we said there ought to be a sworn agreement between us. In other words, a covenant between us and you. Let us make a treaty or a covenant with you that you will do us no harm and we did not molest you, but always treated you well. And then Jay, I think Isaac's probably thinking, uh-huh. <laughs> what was all this about the stopping up the wells and disputing over my wells? And we sent you away in peace. And now you are blessed by the Lord. What does Isaac do? 30, he made a feast for them. They ate and drank. That means that they did the covenant. Early the next morning, the men swore an oath to each other. And Isaac sent them on their way. And they left him in peace. Really amazing uh, insights on being a reconciler and a peacemaker here. Isaac never fights them. And when they come to reconcile, Isaac forgives them. And he confirms a covenant with them that we will mutually operate in peace toward each other. And remember in that day when you were making a covenant, you were putting your life on the line. So the opposition here would say, we'll put our life on the line that we will not mistreat you from this day forward. So Isaac took them at that word and said, okay, let's not have a continuation of all the fighting and all the disputing and all the problems. You treat me well, I'll treat you well. Let's make this covenant. So he's willing to reconcile in the midst of all of the envy, all the jealousy, and all of the rivalry that he faces. And why could he do it? Because he knew he had God's blessing. When you know you have God's blessing, you can operate in peace. When you don't know you have God's blessing, you think, I've got to do this myself. The only way to stop them is for me to stop them. The only way to end this is for me to end this. The only way for me to get this well or to get enough is for me to take it. But when you operate in God's blessing, you say, God can provide for me. It's not up to me to steal, kill, and destroy from them to get what I need. I can trust that God will provide for my needs. Now let's go back earlier in this. Genesis 26. Verse 7. When the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said, she's my sister. Guess what? He learned from his father, right? Abraham did it twice. Now Isaac does. But here's the key phrase, because he was afraid. How often do we make bad decisions because we're afraid? How often do we lie because we're afraid? How often do we say things we shouldn't because we're afraid? When fear rises up, we often say things we shouldn't say. A lot of children, of course, lie because they're afraid of what's going to happen to them if they tell the truth. Did you do this? No. <laughs> All the while knowing they did. He lies. He says, she's my sister because he was afraid to say, she's my wife. He thought. This is where the thoughts get into our brain. The men of this place might kill me on account of Rebecca because she is beautiful. I'm glad he thought his wife was beautiful. That's a good thing right? 
Talked about this last week. You should think your spouse is beautiful. But the bad thing is, is because of that, he thought they might kill him. But look at this key phrase, they might. So often in life, our fears deal with thoughts that come to our brain, this might happen. You don't know how it's going to play out. But we have this in our brain, if I do this, this might happen. And because this might happen, I shouldn't do this because I don't want that to happen. And fear takes over because of the word might. We don't know what's going to happen. But it might happen, so fear takes over and I make decisions I shouldn't make. He might lose his life, so he makes this decision. And he almost loses his wife. You see that? He might lose his life. He makes this decision and almost loses his wife. So all of us have to deal with this idea of might. I'll keep going and I'll come back to that thought. When Isaac had been there a long time, verse 8, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from a window and saw Isaac caressing his wife, Rebekah. So Abimelech summoned Isaac and said, she is really your wife. Why did you say, she is my sister? Isaac answered, because I thought I might lose my life on account of her. So because of what he thought might happen, he made this decision. And that's the way of fear. God calls us to a life of faith, not a life of fear. And living in faith would have said, she's my wife. He would have had integrity. He would have told the truth. And maybe he did lose his life at that point. But he could not have known what would have happened if he stood for the right thing instead of going the wrong direction. But Satan loves to use fear. That's one of Satan's number one tactics is to use fear in our lives with what might happen so we make bad choices and bad decisions. This is something, while I preach or while I'm preparing my sermons, I have to deal with every week. Because I know a lot of you, I know a lot of what you believe, and when I say something, there's always that thought. This person might not like it. This person might disagree with me. This person might think that I'm doing something wrong or bad. But that happens for all of us in every area of life. We have to stand on what we think is the right thing and let the consequences come. Now, here's where the blessing kicks in for Isaac. He doesn't lose his life and he doesn't lose his wife. God is merciful to him. And when we make bad choices, when we make mistakes, when we sin, as we all are going to, because we acted out of fear, or we made a bad choice, or we acted out of our selfishness and sin, then we have to come back to the mercy of God. How do we face that in our life? Being blessed also means that we are living with the forgiveness and the mercy of Jesus Christ. Every sin he's already taken on the cross. Everything's already been paid. When I, when I have made that bad decision, the next step now is to receive God's mercy, to receive God's grace, to receive God's forgiveness because I'm blessed. Finally, the last one I want to address here today, which is not the right order. <laughs> but um, no, I, I did them all. Okay, fear and facing sin, bad choices. Okay, so I did all four of them. Let me wrap this up and put this together. I want you to see here that God kept his covenant with Isaac, who was Abraham's descendant, because Abraham kept his covenant with God. That's why Isaac was blessed. Even in the midst of famine, even in the midst of lack, even in the midst of envy and jealousy and rivalry, even in the midst of fear, even in the midst of his own sins and mistakes, he was blessed. Because God made a covenant with Abraham and kept it. Now, for those of us today, we too are blessed in the midst of famine and lack, 
in the midst of envy and rivalry and jealousy, in the midst of fear and mistakes and sins we have made. Because Jesus Christ kept the covenant on our behalf. We are blessed because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. Again, Genesis 26, verse 5. Because Abraham obeyed me. Because Abraham kept my requirements. Because Abraham kept my commands and my decrees and my laws. Notice none of that says because you did, Isaac. And this is the gospel to us today. And we could insert Jesus here. Because Jesus obeyed me. Because Jesus kept my requirements, my commands, my decrees, and my laws. And because Jesus went to the cross, we are blessed. And we can walk in that blessing. My encouragement for you this week on my challenges, each day this week, regardless of what happens, regardless if you face famine, lack, rivalry, envy, mistakes, bad choices, sins, fear, wake up in the morning and start your day by saying, I am blessed by God. And at night when you go to bed, end the day by saying, I am blessed by God. Night and day this week, let's declare, I am blessed by God. Let's pray. God, we thank you right now for your blessing on our lives. We thank you we are blessed, not because that we do it right all the time, as Isaac did not, but we are blessed because of Jesus and what he did right and how he went to the cross. And God, I thank you that your Holy Spirit resides in us now. So we declare this morning, we are blessed. And God, every day, every day this week, no matter what we go through, when we face these oppositions, when we face these difficulties, when we face these troubles, we declare we are blessed. And we thank you for placing the blessing on us because we have faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. So to close out, we are going to consider, it's one of my favorite hymns, we're going to consider the goodness and the faithfulness of God in our lives. Number 327, great is thy faithfulness.
particularly for today's message, love that line, blessings all mine, 10,000 beside. Receive the blessing of the Lord this week. Know that through Jesus Christ and your faith in him, you are blessed.